Now we're going to enter the Q&A session, final portion of uh, today's panel. And I'm going to ask all of our panelists to come back on stage and keep their microphones muted as we're having some echo in the background. Until it's time to talk, if you could please keep your mics muted. Wonderful. Here you all are. Let me thank you again, uh, each one of you, for taking the time to join in such a relevant conversation today around important dimensions of this Global Goal 16. Um, and again, to thank the, the writers and uh, Journalists and Writers Foundation for bringing us all together at a crucial time. So I, I would like to, uh, as, as the, the moderator of this uh, panel uh, discussion, I'd like to start with, um, would like to hear from your own reflections when it comes to the increasingly important role that youth is playing in peace processes. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you see youth and their opportunities and challenges when it comes to the specific dimensions that you tackle uh, for Global Goal 16. Um, there's quite a bit of momentum right now around the world in terms of elevating and supporting youth as the main agents of change, uh, but really from not just hearing their voices, bringing them to the um, decision-making tables and, and work together to forge change. So that's my question for all of you and whoever would like to tackle it first. Do I have a volunteer? Do I have a volunteer? Yeah, Michael. I'd, 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 be, uh, I'd, be very, I'd be very happy to. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the participation in, 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 of youth has been um, critical in many ways to actually sort of, you know, um, for, for, and responsible primarily for the large shift that we've, that we've seen, especially in, in the UN. I mean, there's kind of sort of been a, an internal and, an, and external acknowledge, acknowledgement that there needs to be reform within the UN. But I mean, this is really, especially leading into UN 75, being pushed by, by um, youth of the, you know, of the caliber of, of Greta Thunberg, but also, all, you know, all of the, 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 the mass of youth working behind the scenes. And I think the technological innovation that we've sort of seen over the last five to 10 years that allows, you know, groups of youth to be able to come together and kind of sort of provide a level of pressure that had never been seen before has had considerable, considerable impact. So in terms of what I think is going to happen in the next five, 10 years, that that'll continue and definitely should. But they definitely have the power to mobilize society in, in different ways. Um, but they also equally, in addition to being provided access to be heard and be at the table, they, they need to be equipped to be um, real change makers uh, through education and tools um, for that. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree, and and I would say that um, you know as as a research institution we do get approached very often to, to and that is often the question you know it is a, a young person that comes a group of young people that come and they say we really want to work on this but what do we do and that's where I think that those of us that that aren't youth uh, can obviously sort of provide the, the best support provide that mentorship provide that guidance as needed and they provide the lifeblood to take it forward. Absolutely. Anyone else would like to comment on, on youth? Paula, ¿puedo sí. decirlo en español? Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> yes. Eh, para mí es fundamental la educación para prevenir, bueno, el tema que, que yo toqué, ¿no? El, para prevenir el tema del de tráfico de material de abuso sexual infantil y también que las empresas proveedoras de internet tengan obligación de denunciar como hay una ley federal en Estados Unidos que sea así en el resto del mundo eso es muy muy importante pero la educación también porque los adultos somos migrantes en la era digital pero los niños no y de todas maneras ambos necesitamos educarnos this if I remember there were uh, but mostly um, what uh, judge Molina is is saying that education is he key here access to education um, is key in terms of understanding the threats, uh, the cyber threats when it comes to 
which she alluded earlier on during her presentation uh, on the, the dangers uh, for, for minors. Um, and also uh, the way we hold um, corporations accountable uh, when they are um, providing their services and, and operating uh, globally and locally. Thank you, Natalia, very good point. Anyone else? Okay, uh, well, I just, just want to share a very small, uh, very brief idea. Uh, I mean, definitely yours are the uh, most important part for future. Uh, and, and when you're talking about the development thing, uh, it is very important to orient them with what, what sort of development we are talking. Yeah, uh, but very encouragingly, most of the youth population within uh, uh, develop and developing world, uh, mm -hmm. they are very pro-green, uh, if I say in that in the very straightforward way, uh, <laughs> they are a very uh, rebellion in, in some extent against the uh, you know so-called establishment, negative impact of uh -huh. the establishment. So these are some of the positive way. They need to be educated. That is that is true. So information is a very important uh, uh, access to information is a very important uh, you know, component in there. Um, uh, you know, education is a very important part uh, there. You know, what sort of education we are providing? Uh, so I would say the SDG, uh, uh, in a way, it has to be a holistic way for, for the uh, you know, youth population. But one important area within the scope of SDG uh, 16, I think, uh, is, is very important for the youth as well, uh, which is a lot of international institutions are, uh, are not that strong. So when you're talking about strong institutions, uh, we are actually sleeping from there. Uh, I mean, we know that what happened with the WHO very frequent, very recently. I mean, this is uh, uh, this is a pandemic time, and, and and what sort of challenge WHO had to face uh, in the face of uh, the operationalization of its own activity. Similarly, you can talk about a uh, lot of discussion about the UN itself. Um, so, so the thing is, youth could be a another vanguard for for next step of uh, you know. Creating a better institution for uh, for the uh, for the world uh, with a new idea of reform, placing themselves within the process of uh, you know not the leadership, uh, if not the leadership, but at least in the process of uh, consultation, uh, that could be in one way to counsel uh, the participation of youth in the entire uh, you know decision making process. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Any more comments on that? Yeah, may I speak, please? Absolutely, so go ahead. You have rightly mentioned, and as uh, Dr. Rahman also mentioned, I think youth has a very critical role because they are the future leaders. And in a country like Pakistan, we have more than 50% population of the country, which is actually, we say, youth, bul youth bulge. I mean, they are between the ages of 20 and 35. So they have a critical role in that. But the challenge is actually, as Dr. Haman also mentioned, that behavioral changes in institutions. And that is the biggest challenge because the organizations are the secondary organizations of the United Nations. I mean, they are not uh, enforcing things in the countries. I mean, their role is more is like of a catalyst or they can just slightly push the things or they can recommend things to different societies and countries. But the challenge within these societies and particularly developing countries is actually to bring behavioral changes within the state-owned institutions and to promote education so that youth can play a better positive role in the coming days. Thank you. Well stated. Could not agree more. We're going to go now to some of the questions we're getting from the audience. Thank you, audience, for participating. Um, Michael, I have one question for you. If you analyze the Global Peace Index 2015 to 2020, what are some of the trends emerged within the last five years? Does the data give us some information for the projection of positive peace in the next five to ten years? Yeah, so so we, we generally see, um, you know, trends or uh, through through um, the GPI and, and positive peace and it's kind of sort of a bit like like the, Titan the Titanic or a slow moving ship right so you generally kind of sort of you don't tend to see it, especially when you're looking at it globally when any major differences between countries tend to kind of sort of smooth out 
uh, you tend you don't tend to see sort of an immediate shift year on year, but and even a sort of a five year time span is relatively short. So we largely expect um, levels of peacefulness to follow that metric, so to 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 essentially slightly decline, similar to positive peace, especially with view of the ongoing civil unrest. Um, we expect positive peace um, and civil unrest to continue to increase in the U.S. and um, in Europe, um, uh, as well as as in Africa. The thing that's kind of sort of been a bit of the spanner in the works, which would I, which can potentially make it horribly worse, um, or, or perhaps has some silver lining, is COVID-19. Um, so, so we, you know, it's too early for us to kind of sort of assess that based on the data that, that we have, but that will significantly have a, a, an impact. Um, due to the massive uh, economic impact that it's had specifically. So um, largely the prognosis is um, not great. Thank you, Michael. I'm waiting for more questions to be sent my way. Here we go. And sometimes they're not addressed to any particular panelists, so feel free uh, to answer uh, as you see, please. How closely do you, you work with grassroots youth organizations where real transformation occurs? You challenge your constituents to give youth a voice and a seat at the decision-making table. This was related to the question that we, to some extent, already addressed. but. Um, now, perhaps more directly, are you working closely with youth in, in, in shaping their uh, involvement and participation? So I'd, I'd actually, if it's all right with you, Paula, I'd actually like um, like to, to jump on this one. To, um, Go, ahead. Uh, Go ahead. So we have a network of, of 1,500 IEP ambassadors um, that essentially um, you know, help um, provide training and help distribute IEP research throughout the world. That's a, an open process. Um, and out of the 1,500 ambassadors, the majority, if not practically all, are youth. Uh, no, the reason I bring that up is because we actually have an open cohort for ambassadors right now as we speak. So if you are interested in uh, becoming an IEP ambassador, please don't hesitate to, to do so. Visit our webpage and we'll be able to register there. Great. Thank you for flagging that. Absolutely. I would like the organizers that, uh, uh, as a follow-up from this uh, conversation, uh, we share the, the number of resources that you um, brought to our attention today, so they can learn more and, and get involved with some of your activities. Anyone else would like to pitch on that very specific question of uh, how are you, from your space, uh, in the Global Goal 16 work, are engaging with youth? Any examples? Okay, I, I think I can just share a very, very briefly about our own, own uh, work. Uh, mm -hmm. As an academic institution, we do work with the youth. I mean, that's that's what our uh, area. Um, uh, but but beside that, we we are creating a lot of uh, you know, extracurriculum program. For example, summer program. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a kind of immersion program. Uh, that that youths are coming and 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 they are coming from across the different country of the world, both south and north. Um, they are uh, trained for a certain period of time, two weeks, and then they sent to the community. They stay with the community people. They learn the community activity and 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 challenges, and also they design some of the solution for the community. So it's a very much uh, uh, you know problem solving method, but uh, but very uh, grassroots oriented. Uh, so they have to stay with the uh, community people for one month uh, and and then observe what are the problem and and solve the problem along with the community participation that's that's just one of the example but yeah that kind of activity that we're doing thank you for sharing i, I was just uh, told that natalia judge uh, molina uh, works with organizations and volunteers that provide training about different types of crimes. So that's important. Um, it's access to education and it's training um, at all levels, um, not youth and beyond. Um, and um, so that, that, that's worth mentioning. Um, at, at my association, the UN Association of the National Capital Area, we work through Model UN. Um, 
I'm sure you most of you are familiar with Model UN. That's the framework that we use to bring about um, uh, knowledge of uh, relevant global issues to middle and high school students in our jurisdiction. Uh, but it's not only the access to that knowledge, it's also the tools uh, that they're going to need to be effective when it comes to advocating for those issues, advocating for themselves, um, and, you know, uh, one day perhaps representing their countries. Um, so communication, negotiation skills, those are critical skills that we want use to succeed. Is we need to give them access, but we also need to give them the tools to be effective uh, agents of change. Um, so that's that's my, my two cents of sharing of what we're doing at the local level. Um, okay, I have another question. How can we ensure good governance in countries where the rule of law and generally constitutionalism are not upheld? Who would like to answer that one? I think, I think that, that directs to me, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, yeah, how can we how can we ensure? Uh, Read it again. How can we ensure can we, can good we, governance in countries where the rule of law and generally governance. constitutionalism are not upheld? Fantastic. I think uh, in my discussion, I try to uh, point those very basic issues uh, that uh, when you talk about SDG sixteen and the component of access to justice. It is very poorly framed, as I said, and, and the indicators are, are very poorly framed there. So uh, it, it doesn't really capture the whole idea of good governance uh, in, in those indicators at all. Uh, so uh, it is very unlikely that when there is uh, not good governance, uh, the access to justice is really there, you know, hardly, hardly any presence there. I just give you a very simple example. Um, a a war-torn country uh, where there is a civil war or a, a military uh, conflict is going on, how can we ensure there is access to justice for all the people there? I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. It's quite impossible. But to capture that kind of uh, phenomena in a, in, a, in a progression report or, or bring that in the context of discussion is oftentimes missing in the present day framework that we have. So that's that's one one big argument. The second argument is when you talk about uh, the excess issues for the judiciary, it is pretty much con you know, contextualized uh, issue. So without considering that context, we cannot really come up with a single set of uh, you know standard uh, for for everything. So that's 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 again a very big challenge. So yeah, I am I am pretty much uh, you know in in solidarity with the same question. And I think this is this is what I have uh, been trying to push uh, in my in my speech as well. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. I, Thank you. I, I, Anyone I else would like to comment, like to comment on, this? on this? Yeah, I'd be very happy to to, to add to, add to that. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm in complete agreement. You know, a lot of the the least peaceful countries are, are caught in what we call sort of a negative feedback loop, right? So it's um, weak institutions providing poor services that lead to an increase in conflict that leads to weaker institutions, right? Um, and, and one of the challenges there is that the solution to that isn't specifically rule of law. You can't have rule of law in a country where people don't have the freedom to eat, right? So invariably the solution is, is a lot broader than, than specifically tackling um, that, um, you know, the question of rule of, of, of law. Um, and basically all elements related to um, good governance need to be reinforced, uh, largely along the lines of sort of the positive framework that I was describing before, um, in order for the rule of law to come into place. Anyone else on this? Maybe Paula. Okay. I could like that it's necessary to unite in common ideas and, and form organization maybe, but organization strong. Thank you. You're alluding to the importance of coming together and collaborating through partnerships, right? Colaboración, el poder de las colaboraciones. Yeah. See? Okay. Anyone else on this? No? Okay. 
just looking at the at the chat um, we are nearing the end and i want to give each one of you an opportunity to ask a burning question from the rest of the panel if you haven't had a chance yet through the internal chat that we have backstage um please feel free um and also then to give me your your summary highlights of, of what you'd like the audience to remember and reflect upon um, about the dimension of Global Goal 16 that you have addressed today as we enter the 75th anniversary of the UN. And this is really a time for, um, <laughs> it's a monumental time for tackling unprecedented challenges, but also to, to come up with a new way of um, living um, and building a sustainable world. Maybe a concluding Maybe. statement in that regard. Thank you, Paula, mm -hmm. for, for bringing uh, uh, the the whole idea of a judiciary is just out of the discussion. It's just concluding statement, so we can say that um, that many government in the world are using judiciary as a tool uh, to perpetuate their authority and power. Uh, this is a very scary situation. When you're talking about judiciary, which is a guard to protect the human rights of the ordinary people, instead of protecting the human rights, it is acting to validate the human rights of the people. So it, this is a very reverse process now going on internationally. And I, I would say where many, many government, those are internationally very well reputed, but back in home, the, the issues like extrajudicial killing, uh, border killing, uh, you know, uh, prosecution of uh, political minorities and political opposition. These are rampant through the judiciary that are taking place. Yeah, uh, and and what we we're, we're seeing is the idea of uh, you know global cooperation in some sort of alliance or or to to, to some extent even supporting some of the you know economic gain. Uh, those governments are being supported and endorsed by international community in many many ways. As I said datas are not really coming uh, in a neutral way so we are not getting the accurate picture about the judiciary independence and functionality of the judiciary so it is acting as a reverse tool to perpetuate the power and authority of uh, many regimes in the across the world so i think that that should be one of the uh, element of the you know future future thought thank you thank you sorry paula thank you yes uh, I would like, yes, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here. My conclusion is that what we are doing here in the case to grow, grow and develop, we need to work together and embrace collaboration to ensure a better world of, for everyone. I think. Thank you. Michael? Michael? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually glad that I get this opportunity to to uh, build on my last remarks, by, uh, which were the prospect is not good. I felt like the temperature of the room just went. <laughs> so I'd like, to, I'd like to clarify that statement in perhaps a slightly more optimistic way. Uh, and that is to reinforce the, the youth leadership and participation um, uh, component that, that, we, that we've already discussed and the amazing advancements that have been done and will be done, no doubt. Number two, the UN 75 and the whole reckoning that the UN is going through, I think, can lead or will lead to extremely, extremely good things and a much faster pace with regards to the SDGs. Um, third, the, the, the degree of technological innovation, perhaps not in terms of, of, of computing processes, but certainly in terms of communication between partners. Uh, one of the positive outcomes, if you will, of, of COVID, I think could also have a significant uh, impact on, on how we approach the issue going forward, positive impact. And then largely, um, the element of resilience. A lot of the countries that have been impacted by COVID um, are going to really be considering, you know, what are the additional measures that they should be putting in place? How should multilateral uh, cooperation be reinforced to deal with these kind of crises in the future? So, in many ways, I don't think you know, COVID never comes at a good time, but but you know, I think that there's a lot that we can learn uh, from it that could um, lead to positive impact in the future. 
Very well said. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Gilani? Yeah, thank you very much. I think SDG 16 is directly related to uh, access to justice and access to information. And, and uh, actually, it is linked to the crime happening in a society. So that is why it is very important, I think, uh, to discuss this issue. And uh, the biggest thing which I mentioned and you also mentioned in your like uh, earlier discussion that the behavioral changes within the institutions that are very important because you cannot bring change in a society without behavioral changes within the institutions, particularly owned by the state. And for that, we need a, a two-way approach, which needs dialogue, which needs tolerance, which needs acceptance of others' views. So if we bring that, then we can mold a society towards a sustainable development goal, towards justice and freedom of expression and information. Without that, uh, we will be facing huge challenges. So that's all. So I think the biggest issue with the developing country is to bring behavioral changes within the institutions uh, to uh, for the making of those SDGs possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank all of you for taking the time to participate in, in today's panel and, and to being a part of, through your organizations and work, shaping the, the, the sustainable development agenda on, on a very, very important goal Global Goal 16, which is really, as we alluded throughout this conversation, um, critical when it comes to also enabling the achievement of the other global goals. Um, we really need to build and sustain peace in order to be able to have access to quality education, have access to health, and, and so on. So. Um, the power of education and advocacy um, uh, is something that resonates and in, in, obviously in some parts of the world is much more challenging than in others. Um, but we're also all much more interconnected around the world and, and tools and ways to uh, help each other and collaborate. So while we are facing unprecedented challenges, as, as you mentioned, Michael, COVID-19 is, is exacerbating every other challenge that we've been facing from climate to inequalities. Um, but it's also teaching us a lesson in terms of re-examining the way we've been living, um, which has not been sustainable. Um, how are we behaving with, with other human beings, with other um, uh, countries, uh, with the planet? we have to re-examine everything and it's, it's going to be a test for being resilient. Um, you're absolutely right about that. Um, but I am, despite those challenges that can be quite overwhelming when one <laughs> thinks about them, I also have hope, tremendous hope in humanity. I think that um, this is happening at a very particular time because the world really needs to evolve to a, a new and more sustainable stage. So uh, we're in this together. I think the pandemic is showing us that we're definitely all in this together and it's bringing a lot of positive um, solutions and aspects uh, um, that, that people are working on. So once again, thank you so much to each one of you for your time today. Keep up the good work, stay connected. Um, we can exchange information backstage. I love to stay in touch with you you explore collaborations and again a big big thank you to the journalist and writers foundation for bringing us all together excellent program thank you so much be safe stay well bye, bye.